you're watching The Protocol TV. I'm going to talk a little bit about not so much the what of Bitcoin and how it works or, or the how um, it's implemented or any of the implementation details. What I really want to focus on tonight is talking about the why of Bitcoin. Why did, are we here? Why do we do this? Um, and to understand the why, you have to have a really deep appreciation for what's gone before, the history of money, and how did money get created in the first place? What is this thing that we call money that we use every day and very few of us ever ask questions about? So I want to talk about, you know, really the, the basics or the history of money. So how did, before we had, before we had money, how did we trade? Barter, barter. barter. So you hear that a lot, right? So, so barter is what we were taught. <laughs> we always were taught that, that commerce always started with barter before we had money. The reality is that's actually not true. So there's a problem with barter, which is a, a problem called the coincidence of needs problem, which means that if I want to trade something with my neighbor, for instance, I have a cow and he's a fisherman, well, I might not necessarily need fish right now. I might need an arrow or something else or a lasso to lasso a cow. I don't necessarily need the fish. Um, and at the same time, that person might not even have fish available at that time. He might not have had a catch, but he needs a cow today. So trade did not start with barter like we're always taught. What it actually started with was what we call a gift economy. And so a gift economy essentially means that, so this is what we think happened. This is what really happened. I don't have any fish. I really need a cow. So I go to my neighbor and I say, hey neighbor, listen, I really need a cow today. I don't have anything to pay you with today because I haven't caught my, my fresh catch. But if you'll lend me a cow now, I'll give you something in the future, you know? And so it was very much a, a trust-based society. It was very friendly and it was very close and tribal, right? So, so you knew that person and they were good. Be you could trust them because, you know, you lived in a community where if you didn't own up to your, your debts, uh, you'd probably be shunned. So we grew our economy based on this gift economy first. And eventually, I would give you an IOU and you'd give me the cow. And then when I had my fish, I would make good on my debt and hand you the fish and our debt would be cleared. And then we'd do that again and again and again and again. Well, as that be got re became really popular, especially when you left your own tribe and went to other tribes, there became this requirement that you had to sort of keep track of who owed who what. And it became very, very confusing. So we started to explore, how do we keep track of these IOUs? And so we tried a lot of things, um, starting with uh, cowrie shells in the South Pacific. And uh, you know, we've traded everything from cattle to uh, salt. Um, many different things have served the form of money over time. But certain, certain types of money had better properties than other. And this was very much an evolutionary uh, process to figure out what worked better than other things. So there were certain qualities that started to pop up with the things that we were trading that made them really, really useful. So the first thing was it had to be really portable, right? So money, you had to be able to carry it from point to point. Uh, carrying a cow from point to point was very difficult unless you were a skilled cowboy. But once, the, once you traded that cow, I mean, how do you carry a cow? Likewise, a, a property or, or a house is not very useful for trade because it doesn't move. Divisibility. So in the cow example, cow is terribly divisible unless it's already dead. But, but you know, if I only uh, have something of value, that, uh, like a fish, for instance, I might trade you one fish, but you're not going to trade me a whole cow for one fish. So we had to have some way to divide up what we were trading uh, to make it so that we could have like kind, right? Durability. So something, if you're going to have some sort of a token that represents a future debt, you have to have that token last. So, you know, anything that was perishable was a, a very bad form of currency because it would die. So, you know, trading leaves of grass or something like that would not really work because it would die and it would wither away. So we needed something that was durable. It needed to be rare. So in the, you know, could we trade with leaves of, of grass? Yes. Or blades of grass? Yes, we could trade with that. But you could easily grow a whole patch of grass, and therefore, each blade is worthless, right? Um, you can replicate it very easily. So we needed something that was, was rare, and ideally naturally rare. So this is a, a concept called fungibility. 
So fungibility means that one unit of a currency or money is exactly the same as any other unit of currency. So for instance, if you think about diamonds, well, diamonds are great. You know, they're valuable, they're desired, they're um, durable. They have lots of really good qualities that could have made them a, a good form of money, or really any gemstone for that matter. The problem is that one diamond is very different from another diamond. Even the exact weight and, and size is very different based on clarity, right? So there's a lot of components there that make them unequal. And it's very difficult to do regular trade with that kind of a, a currency. And then another one here is uh, consumability, or rather, we wanted something that couldn't be consumed very easily. Um, so oil is not a very great form of currency because we use it and we need it, so we use it up. So you're depleting the money supply. And if you deplete it too much, you don't really have anything to trade. Um, so one thing came again and again to serve all these purposes better than anything else, and it really was just pure evolution of money. Uh, gold, right? Gold and silver. Um, they, they basically performed all these functions very, very well. They could be divided up. Uh, you can melt them down, put them into smaller units. You can make coins out of them. And so gold for thousands of years has been one of the most popular forms of money. So now you can basically use these tokens rather than the actual debt itself to trade. So now we have these things that we can trade around, and I can trade it with my neighbor because this gold represents some debt that somebody else owed somebody. And so gold was a token that represented a debt from one person to another, and it became currency because it was traded on its own for its own value. So now I can buy a cow with gold. Well, this became extremely useful. The problem with it is gold is really difficult to store safely and securely. So I don't really want to walk around. These tokens became so valuable that they were in danger, right? So um, there was a lot of theft that went on, and you, didn't w and you could lose these things, and they had tremendous value. So uh, goldsmiths, the guys who were actually making the coins in the first place, got really wise and said, well, you know, because I'm making this gold and it's valuable, I have these big lock boxes that I have to keep my gold in so that nobody steals it while I'm making the coins or whatever. So everybody else has the same protection problem. They're all trying to protect their gold. Well, what if I, you know, this is an engineering businessman who says, why don't I just leverage the extra space that I have in my vault and charge a service to all these people and say, hey, come bring your gold to me. And instead, what I'll give you is an IOU in return. So you give me the gold, and I give you an IOU. And now your, your gold is on deposit at my vault, and I can give you an IOU. You can come and claim it at any time. Well, what they started to realize was that uh, some people would claim their gold, but the large, vast majority of it would never come to claim their gold. And the reason is that the IOU for gold became just as good as the gold itself. And they started trading the IOUs as if it were the gold itself. And so a very engineering uh, goldsmith said, hey, you know, no one's really been to my vault for months. Uh, what if I just made more IOUs than there was gold in the bank? Would anybody ever notice? Right? And so that's exactly what they did. So they began to issue IOUs, and then they began to continually issue more and more IOUs and more and more IOUs, and there was no gold in the vault, but they had this paper that said, don't worry about it, your gold's safe with me. Uh, come and get it whenever you want. Well, the average person is not going to come and get it, and so there's some level of uh, deposits that you need in order to cover the, the daily flow, but you don't necessarily need to have certificates for every single thing that's in the vault. And this is essentially the origins of modern banking, right? The fractional reserve system. And it's the exact same system that our entire society is built on right now. And so these IOUs, uh, over time, got prettier and prettier, and they looked more official and more official. And you started having banks issue their own IOUs on special paper that represented you know, a certificate for your gold. And eventually, we started to nationalize these things. And now that's how we got to the, the idea of national currency. Um, so how many of you here think that the Federal Reserve is run by the government? Okay, this is a smart crowd. All right, so maybe I asked it wrong. But the Federal Reserve is not an organization that's run by the government. The Federal Reserve is a collection of banks. It's a collection of these guys, right, who are basically creating their own currency, creating their own certificates, and saying, hey, don't worry about it. We've got it on deposit. Come and get it whenever you want it. The entire financial system, the entire global financial system is based on this exact principle. And that's why it's so risky. 
because it requires a massive amount of trust. Trust in each other, trust in people, so that we don't all go and run to the bank at the same time and withdraw our value. The entire financial system is purely built on trust. And now we trade it as if it was gold, and we trade it as if it was the original debt. And what happened is as trade expanded ac across the world, banks became extremely useful. You know, carrying, carrying large quantities of gold was very, very dangerous, especially if you were going across the ocean in a ship. There were pirates and all types of dangers. You know, your ship could sink. It was very hard to get from point to point. So banks ended up creating a global network of other banks that they could interact with, and they would have relationships with each other. And this became the sort of foundation of our modern banking system around the world. And they claim to have some very uh, important features, right? So the bank says, well, the reason why you want to use this system is because we can protect your money against theft, right? So bandits come by, don't worry about it, we've got it covered, it's safe behind our armed guards and everything like that. Well, there are no uh, armed guards and there, are, are no, uh, there is no money, but that's what they're telling us, right? That's the story that they're telling us. And then they're also protecting your money from loss, right? So there's a good reason why we don't put all of our cash uh, under our mattress. Uh, you know, your house can burn down and then you're screwed, right? So, or you could lose your money in transit. Um, so you have to protect yourself not only against other people, but you have to protect yourself against yourself. Um, and so the bank is providing that function for us. And then the last thing that the, the banks uh, provide is global convenient access to our money anywhere in the world. So no matter where we travel in the world, I can go to any ATM, put in my card, pull out the local currency, and go and buy a cup of coffee. Um, and that's an extremely valuable feature. Uh, and so it's not that I'm totally against the banking system. It's just that... Uh, like, the, you know, the bank provided some extremely important functions for us, and it's what actually allowed us to build uh, a massive global trading system and, and raised, you know, billions of people around the world out of poverty. Um, but the question that we have now is, do we still need that? Does this technology still make sense? Does the modern banking system still make sense? Well, what if we could replace every function of a bank? And that's the beauty of Bitcoin. That's why we're here today. See, Bitcoin is one of the most incredible, amazing inventions of our lifetime. Because for the first time, it allows us to move value or money from point A to point B anywhere in the world instantly with no third party in the middle. No trust required. No bank to pretend they have the money in the vault. It is a peer-to-peer -peer payment exactly as if I was trading my cow for a fish with my neighbor, except now my neighbor could be in China. So it's really uniting the world. This is a, the most amazing technology, and it's going to change everything that we do. So how do we solve the problems that the bank solved? Well, one of them is security, right? So security is protection against theft and protection against yourself. Well, Bitcoin is really effing cool because Bitcoin can do things that even regular money can't, right? So money has rules that are attached to it. So, for instance, if I were to hand a $100 bill here to Julian, there's a very simple rule that's attached to that transaction, which is whoever holds the 100 owns it. Um, it's a bearer system, right? And so he can take that $100 bill and go to a merchant and buy a cup of coffee, and they will take that $100 bill as if it was uh, good as gold because that's the rule of that system. Well, in Bitcoin, it actually works really similarly, except instead of handing uh, Julian the money, what I'm doing is I'm digitally signing my rights to the money away to him. And I'm doing that with a single key. I'm using a private key that unlocks value that's in a public ledger, and I am moving that value from point A to point B on this public ledger, and I am now granting him access to that money and removing my access. And it is his money, and it's as good as gold. But Bitcoin is programmable money. So what does that mean? That means that we can actually program additional rules into the money itself that must be met before the money can change hands. So, for instance, instead of requiring a single signature, a single digital signature, I could require, for instance, multiple signatures. So, you can think of the analogy of a missile silo where you have one guy with one key and another guy with another key, and they both have to turn those keys at the same time in order to launch the missile. So, we can now do the exact same thing, but with money. So in the GEM platform, every transaction that goes through our platform requires at least two keys. 
And so Jim holds one of those keys, and our customer holds the other. And we have to collude for every single payment to go through the system. So essentially, it's the exact same example as the missile silo. But there's other cool things that we can do here, too. So what happens if Jim goes out of business tomorrow, and you're, you're waiting around trying to, find, trying to sign a transaction, and we no longer exist? Well, we can actually issue a third backup key to the customer so that the customer is always in possession of at least two keys. And this can be an offline backup. It can be generated entirely offline, never touch the internet. It is hack proof. And uh, they always have possession of their money at all times. They always have their, their primary signing key and their backup key. So even if we were to go out of business tomorrow, you can move your money to any wallet in the world without permission from us whatsoever. It's a totally trustless system. And that's the beauty of Bitcoin. We can basically re-engineer solutions from the ground up to solve real societal problems. And we can do it, you know, we have a, a company of 10 people that are doing this. And I just went to a meeting at, I shouldn't say who, <laughs> I went to a meeting at very large banks uh, last week in New York. And, you know, they've got giant high rises of thousands and thousands of people. They had one floor that was just conference rooms, 100 conference rooms, just for their bank. And the only function that they're providing is they're, keeping track of who owes who what at what time, and who owns what, and they're protecting our money. We can do the exact same stuff, but with a fraction of the expense, a fraction of the people, and it's gonna be the most massively efficient system that we've ever seen. And just really quick about our product, and then I'll get off stage, I'm gonna, this isn't a sales pitch really. So uh, we really serve the developer market. We're trying to get this kind of technology in the hands of developers everywhere. And right now there's roughly about 18,000 uh, apps that are currently in development uh, on GitHub that mention Bitcoin. And that represents uh, a 12x increase in just the last year. And the problem is security is really hard. So staggering statistic, roughly 9% of all Bitcoins that have ever existed since its inception have been lost or stolen due to poor key security. That represents about $600 million in lost value. A large part of the reason why this is happening is that Developers who are creating new apps are, are not necessarily focused on security. They're not necessarily security experts, um, nor should they be, to be honest. Uh, and so, you know, not only do they have to build a, a really amazing product and go out and, and find customers, but they also have to be experts in cryptography, security, network security, and the underlying protocols of Bitcoin, which change all the time. Our platform essentially takes all these difficult functions, wraps them all up, makes it really easy for developers, and gives you everything you need to be able to build a Bitcoin app uh, so that you can focus on building just product and not infrastructure. And this is all the code that it takes to send a full, uh, pretty much a full featured wallet. We built a wallet for our uh, TechCrunch Disrupt um, demo uh, using just about this much code. And that's, that's the company. Yeah, I'll stop there. So hopefully, I mean, I know this is a bit of a repeat, but I think sometimes it's really important for us to uh, go back to the basics and the fundamentals and re-understand why we're here and why we're in this room and why we care so much.